Okay. I'm just gonna get this recording here. Okay. Um, oh, I gotta flip my page. Here we go. So yes, it's a 11:20. So we're gonna get started with our next session: uh, food extremes, the paradox of food insecurity and food waste. And um, our host for the session is Modesta and Abu Abugu from the Cornell Alliance for Science. Uh, Modesta is a fellow of the Cornell Alliance for Science and a graduate student in the Horticultural Sciences Department at the University of Florida. Uh, for her master's research, she's using molecular markers to breed for improved flavor in tomatoes at Dr. Harry Klee's lab. Uh, she's passionate about communicating science for impact, especially through promoting access to innovative agricultural tools for smallholder farmers. Uh, so thanks for being with us today, Modesta, and we'll uh, hand it over to you. Well, thanks for the invite, Nancy. It's It's been an engaging day for me so far. I'm very happy to be here, especially listening to other speakers talk about agriculture in Canada and technologies. Actually, my talk is going to be like integrating all the things that other speakers have, you know, talked about. Uh, the Nutrition Babe talked about food waste a little bit, and uh, Kevin Fota talked about technologies in agriculture. So mine is actually going to like give a little bit of more perspective on food waste than talk about those technologies at the same time. So um, like Nancy said, um, I'm doing my master's program in Florida, but just a little bit about me, I'm from the southeastern uh, Nigeria, that was where I grew up. And for those that don't really know about the geography of Nigeria, it's in West Africa. So you can see it's on the map here, it's surrounded by the Mediterranean Sea and the, the Red Sea. And I also happen to be an aspiring scientist. So it's my passion. I want to um, contribute to food insecurity in the world. And for my research, I'm currently working to improve flavor content in tomatoes. You know, every time I hear, I talk to people about my research, they'll be like, oh, wow, it's high time someone gave us a better testing tomatoes. So yeah, it's really a cool and exciting research. Uh, I love doing the work. And also in addition, I, I love to do science outreach and communication. And that is partly because of one of the challenges that Kevin Fota mentioned. The reason why technologies have not been adopted as much as it's supposed to is because scientists barely talk about it. They usually don't like to engage with the public. So this tide is changing now. And in addition to becoming an aspiring scientist, I love to talk about the work that I do. Um, so, well, before we, uh, we, I, I get on the presentation, I wanted to get your perspective about food waste in your own community. So I have two questions for you. If you can please uh, type on the chat box and I'll be reading it, I'm connected on two screens. So if you can please respond to the question on the chat box. So the first one is your favorite food. And the second one is how many people do you think um, go to the food bank in Canada every month? So um, while I'm talking, I would love to read your responses on this. So, um, well, so to start the presentation about the about food waste, this data is kind of what you see every when, whenever you pull up anything about food waste. So about one third of the production of the food that is produced everywhere in the world goes to trash, and it's ironic that. Out of this uh, amount of food that goes to waste, it's just enough to feed four times the amount of people that go to bed hungry every night. And that's like over 800 million people. So I, I see in the chat that there are so many talks about rib ice stick. Um, Connie said chocolate is a favorite food. Yeah, so thank you for all the responses. And the interesting thing is that the amount of food that we eat every day actually, I mean, that we waste every day actually could be enough to feed four times the amount of people that go to bed every, every night. Um, so I'm stressing this because it's something that a lot of consumers don't know. I myself did not know. I had to educate myself about this. But the fact is that food is wasted along all value chain in, ag in agriculture, ranging from production to storage, to processing, distribution to the market, to consumption. But then in developed countries like the US, the Can Canada, Europe, and all parts of other developed countries, consumption is what contributes to most of the food that is wasted in, um, in all of this value chain. So um, looking at the differences, you see in high income countries, an average American, for example, wastes about 20 pounds of food every month. 
And that is just at the consumption area alone. When you include the parts of production and storage and everything, you're going to even see a higher amount of food wasted. While in developing countries like in Africa, 40% um, of the food that is wasted comes from production. So why is there this difference? I guess it has to do with technology adoption in addition to the fact that, you know, agriculture is more like a practice here on a commercial level while in developing countries, it's more like in a subsistence level. So, but then to highlight this again, consumer behavior contributes to the majority of the food waste that is, um, that is, that, that, makes up the one that is that happens in developed countries so um in canada for example i see a lot of your favorite food that is on the chat chats here is actually part of the food that is wasted in canada like vegetables contribute like 30 percent of the waste that is recorded in canada every year 15 percent is from fruits most of it also comes from food that should have been eaten but wasn't eaten maybe because there is just too much at that moment or you don't like the taste or, you know, there are just so many reasons why some of this food get wasted. So it's interesting to see this data on, you know, how many of our favorite food gets wasted every day. So then to break it down to the, the specific fruits and vegetables, every day Canadian consumers waste about 40, 470,000 heads of lettuce, about over a million tomatoes is wasted every day. This is for one day, imagine calculating it by 365 days, the amount of food that is gonna be wasted. Every, uh, every consumer in, in Canada wastes about 2 million potatoes, over 750 loaves of bread, over 1 million apples, over 500 bananas, over 1 million cups of milk, and over 450,000 eggs every blessed day. And you know the ironic thing about it is that 840,000 Canadians seek food from the food bank every month. So it's, it's amazing to see that there is this paradox, there is this discrepancy between how many food is wasted and how many people actually need those food that is wasted to, you know, not to go to bed every, hung, every night hungry. Well, coming down to developing countries, 20 million Africans go to bed hungry every night. 160 million uh, children suffer from severe acute mal malnutrition. And that is because of the inability of them to access these common fruits and vegetables or food that is even high in vitamin A iron, and zinc because their staples is usually like really starchy products and it's, it's actually not giving them enough nutritional supplements. About 3.2 million children under the age of five die every year from lack of food, from lack of uh, nutrition. This is an alarming number and this data can go on and on and on. But the fact is, it's important for us to, awake, to be awake to this reality about the food paradox in these different parts of the world. So while we mentioned, why I mentioned that uh, food, food waste comes from consumer attitude in developed countries. In developing countries, what we see all the time is food waste that comes from on-farm production, shipping and processing and storage. Look at this picture. This is how tomatoes have been transported from the farm to the market. This is a picture that was taken in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, the weather is usually hot. So imagine the amount of food that is, the amount of tomatoes that will be wasted before this food gets to the, to the market. Like, by the time it's heated under the sun and everything, half of it will be damaged. So this is the most important contribution of uh, food waste in developing countries. Well, in addition to that, actually, over 80% of African uh, staples is lost to diseases, to pest infestations. Like we have the one of Maruka in Kalpi, um, Shudbora in Brinjal. You see all of these diseases and pests that affect our uh, food. We also have some of them that is, um, that is caught. I mean, this is just not a thing of developing countries. Here in the US and even in Canada, there is also like the disease and uh, pest infestation. But then there are lots of technologies that are available to combat this. While in developing countries, there is still the low adoption of some of these technologies like um, Kevin Fulter mentioned. So, um, well, let's just talk about how food waste impacts us in general. So, um, okay, so multiply the 
let's say one million, one million tomatoes that is wasted every day, multiply it by 365 days, that's 360 million tomatoes wasted every year. And imagine how much is going to contribute to the greenhouse gas emission, because it's like dumped outside the environment. There is even no proper way of discarding this. It contributes a lot to greenhouse gas um, em emission. And we are trying to feed the growing population. So food waste, the more we waste food, the more it's impacting our growing population because food that is wasted is not enough to feed people in so many parts of the world. So our growing population is really suffering from this. There is a lot of habitat loss that comes from food waste because the amount of food that is dumped on the, maybe a land that is supposed to use as a farmland, it leads to loss of habitat and it degrades the soil, making it, um, really difficult to grow food on. It also wastes oil. Remember the food, there is a long uh, food chain that goes from production to shipping to processing. And in all of this food chain, there is like technology being used, equipment are being used, oil is used to fall all of this equipment. So food waste, uh, waste oil a lot. It also wastes land, like I mentioned, land that could be used for forages or could be used for other things um, are being wasted. Um, then also it harms the biodiversity. Some of these wasted food are dumped in the ocean. Uh, and let's say fishing happens all the time just for us to have enough. And most of this fishing goes, um, and most of these fishes are, you know, they are killed and wasted at the same time. So like thinking about the cycle that it goes through, food waste just causes a lot of damage all around. So still on who suffers the impact. We might be thinking about food waste as a thing that is like generic, it does not apply to a specific person, but it, it does. It, happen, it affects everyone all over the world. Me, the, the person that is wasting food and the person that is not wasting food. So small and medium scale farmers suffers most of, most of the impact because they, they talk day and night trying to get just about enough to for their family and to sell, maybe to get some income. And yet this food gets to be wasted by maybe insect or pests in the farm or a lot of other factors. Women, farmers and young children in many developing countries also feel these, the burns. The environment, like I already mentioned, causes reduce, redu reduced nutritional um, status. Economic value, yes, there is a lot of contribution of food waste to the economy, consumers, retailers, animals, even they, they pay for this, they, they are impacted by this food waste. Um, so having talked about the problem, how do we uh, talk, how do we address food waste? Um, as a consumer, the first thing is for us to be aware. So when we are shopping, it's very important for us to look, look, and double check and see that the food that you're going to buy is not the food that you already have, just to avoid having a lot at the same time. Plan your meals, prioritize using what you already have, make a list of the ingredients you need. I'm very bad at this, I'm a very bad shopper. So <laughs> when I'm talking to all of you, I'm also talking to myself because I, I just go to the grocery store and I pick whatever I find. Some of them, I don't end up eating it. So it's very important to make a list of what you need, buy the quantities that you need. Then when storing food, make sure you use proper storage procedure just so that you maximize the life span, or freeze them for longer, make a box for the things you need, use your nose and judge if the, the, if the food is still good or not. Don't throw it just because you feel like this should be thrown away. Then also for preparation, produce as, as much as you can eat, use perishables before they go bad, save time, and um, make sure you eat leftovers too. I know there are lots of people who don't like to eat lot le leftovers, but when you think about throwing that leftover and what it's going to do to the climate and the number of people that go to bed hungry every night, you might actually be inspired to eat the leftover because it won't, it won't actually do anything bad to your system. So um, in, most in most developed countries, um, there are lots of technologies that are available to um, reduce food waste. Like uh, Kevin Fultz already discussed some of those high technologies. Um, for the consumer-based technologies, there are lots of apps that are available online um, that you can use to calculate maybe the amount of food you should eat, the amount that you could save by not eating this particular amount. There are lots of um, um, softwares and tips online on how to control all of these things. But then, 
talking about these ones that actually is not caused by humans, it's caused by diseases and infestation. How do we control this unfarmed food waste? Well, in most developing countries, this is what farmers go, go through. They have to spray the, their farm three times a day sometimes just to make sure that the insects and pests do not damage their, their farm so much. But you know, exposing themselves to all of these chemicals and insecticides is very harmful for their health. It's also very bad for their environment. So this, in addition, in, in, in as much as they are trying to find a solution to food waste, unfound food waste through this, it's also harmful for the environment and causing so many other um, problems. So, well, there are plant improvement techniques that are available. Kevin Fota mentioned some of them, and one of it is the GM technology that it's actually been taught a lot by so many other speakers here, which made me really happy. I, I, I thought I was going to be the only one talking about GMOs, but yeah, I'm very glad that a lot of us know about this already. So I want to ask you another question. What do you think about GMOs? A lot of people have talked talked about how it's good for the environment and everything, but I want to get your own personal perspective. So please feel free to um, put it up there in the chat. I want to know what you think about GMOs. So um, this technology, the genetic modification technology, it can actually make crops resistant to pests, insects, and diseases. And um, in as much as there are other technologies that, are, that exist, GM technology also has a potential to uh, reduce environmental impact. Another high, pre high precision technology that is being talked about and adopted is genome editing technology. It's very popularly known as CRISPR. So there is like a lot of technicalities around that technology too, um, but I'll just focus on talking about GM technology because it's been widely adopted in Canada and other parts of the world. So how are these GM crops made? First of all, it's, it's, a, it's mostly um, scientific, but I won't base on the scientific area. I'll just talk a, a little bit about the preliminary product uh, way it's made. So first of all, scientists identify um, maybe a specific uh, crop that can conf that already has a natural resistance to a crop. They sequence the DNA of that crop. They copy a particular gene that they want, insert it in the one that you that they want to improve. Then they grow these crops in the greenhouse and see how it's done. So I have here a video that explains this pro uh, product process um, quickly. So I'll just play it for you guys. Genetically modified organisms are organisms that have been altered using genetic engineering methods. The key steps involved in genetic engineering are to first identify a trait of interest, then isolate that trait, insert that trait into a desired organism, and then propagate or breed that organism. For years, farmers have largely relied on chemical insecticides to protect their crops. But in 1996, farmers were introduced to genetically engineered corn with resistance to the European corn borer. These genetically modified plants produce proteins derived from the soil bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis, hence the name Bt maize. The proteins that are produced by the bacteria are crystal proteins, which are toxic to caterpillars like the corn borer, and are introduced into the corn through a process called transgenesis. The first step in this process is identifying an organism with the desired trait. In this case, something that is toxic to caterpillars. Around 100 years ago, silkworm farmers noticed that populations of silkworms were dying, and scientists discovered that a naturally occurring soil bacteria was causing the deaths. Scientists now know that these soil bacteria that are toxic to silkworms are also toxic to the European corn borer. The next step in the transgenesis process is to extract the desired DNA out of the bacteria. This is accomplished by taking a sample of bacteria containing the gene of interest and taking it through a series of steps that separate the DNA from the other parts of the cell and isolate the gene of interest, usually using cloning vectors. The next step is gene insertion. In our case, getting the Bt gene into the corn. Since plants have millions of cells, it would be impossible to insert a copy of the transgene into every cell. Therefore, tissue culture is used to propagate masses of undifferentiated plant cells called callus, which are kind of like stem cells in humans. These are the cells where the transgene will be added. The transgene is inserted into some of the cells using various techniques, such as with a gene gun or by electroporation. The main goal of these methods is to deliver the transgene into the nucleus of a cell without killing the cell. The cells can then be treated with a series of plant hormones, allowing it to grow into an entire plant. You now have corn crops that contain their very own insect resistance. 
The huge benefit of this is that one, the corn crops don't get destroyed by these caterpillars, and two, that less insecticide is needed to combat them. So um, as, as you see from the video, it's evident that using this kind of technologies can actually help at least reduce uh, food waste that comes from disease and insect infestation on the farm and also conserve the environment because you don't need as much chemicals as you would when Genet grow growing other crops. So um, where are these GM crops grown? Actually, 95% of the canola that is grown in Canada, they are GMOs. So it's interesting to see how it's actually helping the economy become really um, self-sufficient. In the US, a lot of crops are grown in the US, about 10 of them. Spain is also leading in, in growing some of these crops in Europe. There are 10 uh, countries in Latin America that are growing GM crops and Brazil. But in Africa, for example, in some of developing countries, it's just two countries, um, no, three countries, sorry, South Africa, Iswatini, and um, Sudan. So this also comes up to talk about the um, paradox about food uh, security and food adoption. So in these high income countries where these high technologies are adopted more, the food waste is even being done more. While in the countries that are going hungry and they do not need um, have food as much, they are not even adopting technology more. So what, com what brings some to some of these things? It's majorly because of the activism that surrounds the technology. So people claim to know that they, they, they claim to think that they know what is good for farmers. Meanwhile, all of those arguments and controversies about GMOs is affecting most of developing countries that do not really have access to these tools. Um, so um, we have talked about um, how, how these technologies can actually help reduce food waste, but then it can also help to produce more tasty fruits and vegetables with higher shelf life. At least if you have a tomato that tastes as good as an apple, for example, you're definitely not going to throw it away because it tastes good. And that is one of my goals as a researcher. That's part of what we are hoping to do. So you also have more nutritious food. You're also going to have disease and drought resistant plants, um, that also require fewer environmental resources. You use less use of pesticides, you have higher yielding, faster growing plants and animals. These are some of the benefits of some of these innovative technologies. And why I'm talking about this is because we need to advocate more for it to be adopted. I have an example. Um, the Nutrition Babe talked about the uh, virus resistance, uh, resistant papaya in Hawaii. So this is Johnny Camilla. She's actually my friend. Um, she, she her, her dad is a papaya grow, grower, and he was one of the farmers who adopted the virus resistant papaya. I think in 1998, this caused the uh, papaya ring spot virus devastated a lot of papaya farms in Hawaii. And he adopted the technology when it was developed in, I think, around 2000 or so. And they have already talked about how much this technology have helped their farm, how it has helped uh, save the papaya industry in all of Hawaii. Then Kevin Fota mentioned something about brin brinjal. So brinjal contributes to most of the food, uh, it's, it's one of the staple in Bangladesh and India, and about 150,000 farmers grow this crop. But then brinjal is devastated. It's, there is this ballworm that affects, I mean, it's not ballworm. I don't know what the insect is called, but it affects uh, brinjal, causing a lot of devastation to, to eat in the soil. So, but thank God for scientists who developed some of these technologies, yeah, GM technologies. Farmers like Abdus Salam has already is already reaping benefits from growing GM brain gel, which is modified, which is resistant to the insects that affect it. So he always says that higher income from BT brain gel helps him to pay school fees for his and improve his family's life. This is an inspiring story about adopting technologies in agriculture to help solve on-farm food waste. We also have an example of food waste that comes from the environment, droughts. Um, crops that cannot resist drought and everything. We have this corn, for example. This this technology, when at, when it's um, access to it is created in parts of Africa, can actually help to um, improve crops. We also have the cowpea. Cowpea happens to be my dad's favorite, which is why I always like to talk about cowpea. Because we, when I was growing up, we would eat cowpea every day, and we as kids, we didn't like it. We wanted more of the sugary stuff. But yeah, my dad liked cowpea a lot. But then 
a cowpea, this um, Maruka insect causes like about 80% devastation on cowpea. Luckily, farmers in Nigeria just um, approved for cow, uh, BT cowpea, that's GM cowpea to be released to them. And we hope that this devastation uh, will be reduced. We also have the late light resistant tomatoes and I mean potatoes and every other, and so many other crops. We have a farmer like Jemima who is in Uganda. She grows cassava and she has already decried how the virus, this is virus resistant uh, on cassava. See how it damages the root, it damages the crop all over. So she hopes to access this technology because it will help her produce high yielding uh, cassava varieties. So in summary, my message here is that we can actually um, contribute to reducing food waste and GM crops could actually help to reduce on-farm food waste, especially in, co in countries where they have not been um, adopted that much. So there are so many potential benefits. It can help to um, produce safe and improved food, mitigate climate change, increase crop yield, conserve biodiversity, preserve the environment, and overall help to alleviate poverty and hung hunger. So you may wonder, why should I care about all of this talk? I mean, maybe in my family, I see someone on the chat saying we, we don't, we don't um, waste any food in my family. That is really good. And that is why you will be a good advocate. You'll be an example of someone who can talk about this using your family's food waste um, initiative, let me put it that way, as an example. So because you know that when you waste food, you waste money, not just your own money, but the money that is invested in growing the food. You waste efforts. The farmers all over the world who tell day and night just to make sure that they produce enough food for you. You waste plan planetary resources. You also um, contribute to methane gas, which uh, causes a lot of environmental pollution. So now what can you do about this? We all can educate you, ourselves. I am also doing this self-education now. And we also can become advocates about this. You can write about it, talk about it. Any instance you see, you see when someone is doing something that is wasting food in any way, please talk about it and tell them how it's contributing to these alarming figures of um, hunger and malnutrition in the world. And maybe we can also in introduce food waste exercises in our curriculums as teachers. Um, I have um, in the next slide, some of those resources that I, I managed to gather online. Then we can also sensitize people at every opportunity, then present and share good information about all of these plant improvement technologies that we have been talking about. So some of those resources are here. This is one from the Rethink Food Waste Initiative. It provides like a roadmap. It's a video resources, which is quite interactive. You can use it and share with our students. We also have another one. It's uh, produced by a Canadian, I think, I don't know if it's a company, but it's called Love Food Hates Waste. So it's a video, they produce videos that tell you how to store your food in the refrigerator, how to package certain kind of food, just so that you'll be able to consume it at the right time. It also gives you some home tips on how to, you know, uh, con reduce food waste at home by saving them in the proper glasses and, and uh, containers. So we also, I, there is also this curriculum that was developed in, by Purdue University that it's um, interactive for students. So it produces, uh, it, it's like information for all, for K-12 students on how to reduce food waste and exercises that they can do. Um, then on GMOs, there are so many amazing resources on GMOs out there. We have the one ISA, it, they produce all data on and information on GM technology and its adoption all over the world. We have the GMO answers, the Cornell Alliance for Science, um, they also talk about how, how to reduce misinformation around GMOs and how to promote it as a social justice issue. We also have the Genetic Literacy Project. As you can see, the, the podcast that Kevin mentioned about is highlighted as the first there. So he hosts the tech, uh, Talking Biotech podcast, and sometimes I join to co-host some of the podcasts, but they say a lot of things about um, agricultural technologies that can help uh, feed the world. So it will be important to share with your, uh, your students and other people. So um, in conclusion, wasting food is like stealing from the poor. So it's really important from, for all of us to be sensitive about this and try as much as possible to contribute to the effort to reduce food waste. So thank you so much for all your 
contributions on the chat. Um, it's really informative and I'd love to come back and take the questions um, next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Modesta. Do you have time for a question or two right now? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've, I've seen a, a couple of people have wondered about uh, whether uh, you think that GMOs contribute more to uh, mono monocultures and a lack of biodiversity. Well, that's a very good question because um, there are lots of, I, I think, was it um, Megan that mentioned it, but there was someone that, that mentioned it over the course of this talk about how we can, how they think how people say it contributes to lack of biodiversity. So I'll speak from my experience as an advocate. I've not grown GMO myself, but I know there are farmers who have grown it, and it does not contribute to lack of biodiversity because there is this myth that you cannot grow G or any other crops around you when you grow GM crops. I've actually been to um, BT cotton farms where you can see. You can grow both of them at the same time and you see them actually doing as well as they expect you expect them to to be but the difference only is that you can obviously also see the devastation being caused on the cowpea that doesn't have gm uh, technology in it so it does not contribute to lack of biodiversity rather I, it actually does the opposite it kind of helps the cohabitation of all of those other um, plants and animals that should go there. So yeah, there are lots of resources online about this. And there are like, if you go to the Cornell Alliance for Science website, there is like this FAQ about monoculture, about biodiversity, about saving the planet, saving the bees, using even, there are just so many myths that has been corrected online about these GMOs and going to all of those resources will help um, to inform more about it. That's great, thanks Modesta. And then I had a couple of people wondering about, and there have been some rumors uh, going around about farmers in India and uh, have saying that the GMOs are really causing problems for farmers in India. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that also happened in Burkina Faso. And um, so there are two sides to every story, right? The anti-GM groups tend to spread that part of the information. And the thing is that people kind of hear that more than people hear about the success stories. Vandana Shiva is one of the culprits of that. And she takes, a, I think they, they pay her 40,000 USD every, to every talk she attends about GMOs. And that's because she spreads fear. So she's very, very good about trying to let people believe the opposite about GMOs. So the thing is that the suicide, um, Thing in India has been happening for quite a while, even before GM crops had been introduced in their farming system. But because there is already like that, that is already widespread, activists use that as an opportunity to maybe try to in, just put the blame on GMOs. But before then, Indian farmers were already going through such losses. And that was actually what led to the low adoption of BT cotton in India. So like I mentioned, all of these things are misconceptions and myths. When we listen to the actual farmers who grow this, there is this Global Farmer Network pro pro program that I am also part of. If you listen to these farmers tell their own stories, you realize the difference between the information that the activists spread and the real information. Vanaya Shiva probably is not a farmer. I don't know, but I'm sure she's not a farmer because Listening to the farmers talk about this by themselves makes you believe, okay, which one is the real story here? Which one is a real fact here? So some of this misinformation, uh, we are trying to debunk them. So the story about India and BT cotton, they are not as true as they claim to be. Nancy, do you mind if I ask a, a question here? Be, I, I just it'd be easier to ask this way than, than writing it out. Uh, you know, as growing up as a kid, you know, my parents would always say when we were throwing food out, oh, do you know how many kids this could feed in Africa? Or there's, there's kids in Africa that don't have food, right? And always that kind of, that guilt trip. And, and the thought as a kid or my students, yeah, but how does saving, how does reducing food waste here help anyone anywhere else in the world, right? How do we bridge that gap? How do we connect food waste here with uh you know the paradox and lack of food in, in other parts of the world um and and any ideas on how we uh, make that impact with with students here reducing food waste what, is, what does that do in the broader context uh, for the world 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And that's something that I started to think about when I was, you know, preparing this presentation. We may not actually have like a direct channel where reducing food waste here directly impacts people in Africa. But the fact that knowing that actually this food could have gone to help another family who couldn't afford it is just as good enough. So just reducing food waste, at least, we know that it's immediately impacting our society, even if it's not on the long run, directly impacting people in Africa. It's immediately impacting our society, the environment and everything. And another thing, talking about the environmental pollution that comes from food waste, Africa suffers the brunt of it because the environment is the environment. And they said the um, impact of climate change, even though countries like China, US, and all other developing countries have the most um, industries and factories that contribute to environmental pollution. Africa is feeling the brunt because the environment is the same and like somehow it also causes devastation there. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that we might not actually be able to directly connect these two things but the fact that we are self-aware that oh there is someone in another part of the country who this would have been very important who would, who this would have been very useful for or there is even people in our community the homeless in our community who would have benefited from eating this food is just as good enough as helping a kid in africa so yeah hey thank you uh, thank you. Modesta. thanks did you have another question neil or no, that's good. Thank you. You're good. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dustin. I just wanted to mention as well that um, we have some Egg for Life resources that uh, tackle this issue as well. Um, we have our Nourishing Minds publications. Uh, we've, put, we've got three publications out so far, and they're tackling uh, food waste, food insecurity, and some of the sustainable development goals. So um, at the end of the day, or tomorrow, when I send out your survey uh, about the day, once you uh, submit that, you'll get a copy of our Nourishing Minds um, publication in your uh, teacher package that you'll get uh, sent out following this event. So you can keep your eye out for that. And it uh, fits nicely with all of the things that uh, Modesta was just telling us about. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, really appreciate it. Fantastic. Um, really, some of those numbers are really shocking. Um, but lots to think about for sure and lots of things that we can uh, take back to our students. Um, so on that note of talking about food waste and food insecurity, it's lunchtime. So hopefully we all uh, will be very uh, conscious 